international cooperation between Europe and key stakeholders. Welcome. Glad Thank you could you. be with us. <laughs> and I'm pleased to introduce Ben Hill. He is the head of Europe at Trina Solar. Where are you, Ben? There you are. He joined Trina Solar in April 2009 and has also served as its global vice president of sales and marketing. He has over 24 years of experience in photovoltaic, including 10 years at BP Solar. Welcome to you, Ben. And also with us today is Izumi Kaizuka. She is senior consultant and overseas manager at RTS, a Japanese consulting firm with nearly 30 years of experience in research and data analysis on PV-related matters, including policy, technical development, industry status, and market trends. Welcome. Thank you. And we have Min Lee with us as well. He is the chief engineer and acting program manager of the Solar Energy Technologies Program at the U.S. Department of Energy. He helps manage and balance the portfolio of research, development, demonstration, and deployment. Prior to joining DOE, Mr. Lee was with industry. Welcome. <laughs> Chetan Solanki is the principal investigator at the National Center for Photovoltaic Research and Education in India, as well as associate professor in the Department of Energy Science and Re Engineering at Indian <laughs> Institute of Technology. Glad you can be with us. And last but definitely not least, Tom Wu is Secretary General of the Asian Photovoltaic Industry Association, and its members include 670 firms, 23 industry associations, and 15 research institutions. It aims to collaborate to develop new technologies to achieve economies of scale and to identify market opportunities. Very glad that you're here. I'd like to start out with a quick regional survey since we have such an amazing uh, array of uh, geographic uh, distribution here. And starting out with uh, you, Mr. DeSanti, Europe does account, of course, for the bulk of global demand still. Uh, we saw those numbers. Other places are coming up faster, but at the moment it is, of course, still Europe with 75% of all new capacity in 2011. Mm -hmm. EU countries are more than on track to reach their solar targets for 2020. Those targets, of course, a very big part of the EU effort. Should they actually be considering upping the ante and getting even more ambitious? Mm. Good question. We start already immediately from the very core, core question at the moment. Indeed, you're right. Europe started to consider how energy and energy needs will develop and develop in Europe. Not only in Europe, in the world, but for us in Europe it's very important to, to take a look and to take as soon as possible adequate measure for what is going to be in the near future. Now, as you know, we started already years ago trying to identify how we can better reach the minimum target for energy production altogether in Europe because we saw that there were different attempts in different member states which were not very well connected to each other. So we, we started to develop what we call Strategy 2020, which is again a series of targets that we need to achieve all together. We also set up what we call the Strategic Energy Technology Plan, which is again is an attempt to coordinate in a more consistent way, in a holistic way, the different energy policies to be developed in the different member states. So we would like to avoid what we have still yet, the so-called fragmentation you know, and disparity, and instead to have a better coordination, better harmonization of the different approaches. So this is what we have now achieved. We have now a plan. Now I can show you in a minute possibly where we are at the moment that, on that respect. But we have, what we have understood and is already, I think it was also last week, announced by Commission Heltinger, that we need already to start to talk about beyond 2020. As you said now, possibly we can even, in fact, achieve e even better result than what plan in our strategy 2020. So we need to start talking about target by 2030, and of course to reach the final goal to have a decarbonized energy production system by 2050. So it's now that now the commitment are growing and which means that we need also to find a way to achieve this commitment, which is, as you said before, I agree, technology, innovation is very important. We need to have proper policy measures. 
we need to have collaboration, international collaboration among the different continent in a way that will not be more isolated. So dialogue also here, again, EU, EU Asia, but not only Asia, US, Japan, and also Africa is very important. So again, it's a very complex <laughs> issue where all the components should be, should be properly mixed together. And if you allow me, I would like, if you, if you think I could, uh, to show immediately where we are on the way 2020, so that we understand how the next step or next objective would be better set. So if I can have the very first slide. Yes. Okay, so here is just the share of electricity production in Europe via PV over the years. And as you see now by 20. 12, we are by 2.2% production in Europe. And as you see, by 2020, what we can simply extrapolate by the action plan presented by the different member states, we have a plan to reach 2.4%. This is, let's say, let me say, the commitment taken or the, the forecast taken by the member states in 2009, because this was again the, the, the reply to the new directive uh, adopted in 2009. So this is, the, let's say, what we can plan now for the time being. But if you see, we do have a, a blue shadow area, which means we can be also somewhat ambitious by 2020. And the, the range goes from, let's say, minimum, let's say, from 6% to a maximum of 12%. These are, for example, the range of P share of PV in Europe. If we do, however, manage to implement some additional measures. You see, it mentions smart grid, which is a very clear indispensable condition, which is necessary for the PV to be developed. So besides the, the technology for, for PV, we do also need to, to have an intelligent distributed uh, infrastructure which allows the, the, the PV to become also convenient for the, the, for the customer, for the, for the users. We do need this kind of internal coordination, which is called the set plan. So the, at the moment, what we do consider is that this is the, the range within which the market will evolve in Europe. Now, the, the, the market usually evolves more rapidly than what we plan. And I'm quite sure that if I do compare now the second slide, I can show you now. This is the, what we call parity grid. So this is just the comparison of the cost to produce electricity with the photovoltaic system, so the PV, compared to the average. Uh, also, the, the, in fact, to the, the retail prices. So if you like, this is the final result of three different layers overlapping to each other. No? If you do consider first the, the retail prices in Europe, which, as you know, varies from, let's say, 14 cents up to 24, 26, 28 even cents per kilowatt hour. Then you should compare, you should consider the solar irradiation map which is produced by us by the GRC in Europe you know, and, and there you can consider of course a different irradiation uh, capacity and then finally you do calculate the cost to produce PV including everything so the initial investment the 20 years lifetime and also the, the, the interest rate and then you come with this uh, very interesting map where you see that the price or the cost to produce electricity via PV, the yellow means is below the cost, the retail, the retail prices. And you see that in part of Europe, including the Northern Europe countries like Denmark and Germany, it's already costing less than the retail prices. You do have, of course, the very clear case, case of Cyprus, where it's very much more, 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 let's say, uh, less expensive than the, the normal retail prices. But what I think is very interesting is that this, this map, which again indicates that it's not only the south of Europe, where you can, you can expect that the, the PV production cost is already competitive, but also the north. 
And you see that also in the south of France, Belgium, Austria, you do have already a white area, which means the break event is there. So again, the, the, actually the market in Europe is evolving much faster than what we can anticipate. As soon as you give some, but of course we need to give them support, stable policy condition to the investors, stable, stable support to the innovation process. And this is what I think looks like very promising in Europe, in Europe too. Then maybe we'll discuss later on where innovation is needed. But just to give a very first flavor, Europe is progressing quite faster on track for the 2020 target, even more. We have already discussed the possible targets beyond 2020, and the market, the, the, the reality is following us, if not anticipating us, because again, I don't know how many could already think that Denmark you know, is already, PV is already competitive on respect the traditional fossil fuel based <coughs> electricity production. No, despite it's not definitely in the South Mediterranean area. So this is something which is very, in my view, important. And I'm sure the next year this map will expand further and maybe large majority of Europe will be already yellow. So two questions that I get out of that are, how do we get policy tools that are flexible enough mm. to cope with perhaps unexpectedly positive developments in some cases? And secondly, mm. how do we get policy tools that are stable, as you said, stable? Mm. I'd like to go now to Izumi Ka uh, Kazuka because Japan, of course, has now decided to adopt one of the policy tools that helped make some of those areas of the map so yellow, namely feed-in tariffs. You have just adopted a very lofty feed-in tariff, but what about that word stable? How stable is